So thanks for coming. Glad you're here. This is the Gonzaga Socratic Club. Uh, I mentioned uh, a moment ago, if you just got here, we have a sign-up list for the events of the Socratic Club. It's a listserv that I do not bombard people with. I only send about eight to ten emails a year uh, uh, concerning the events of the Socratic Club. We meet about once a month. If you haven't heard uh, me give the spiel about the Socratic Club before, uh, we take our name from the Oxford Socratic Club, which was presided over in the mid-1900s at Oxford. Uh, it was presided over by the famous Christian apologist, author, and um, uh, literary scholar C.S. Lewis. And we, uh, we follow the same uh, motto and plan of the Oxford Socratic Club in that we follow the argument wherever it leads, that's the Socratic angle. And uh, the general objective is to explore, inquire into Christian worldview issues. Lewis uh, wrote about the Socratic Club about halfway through the time that, uh, that he was involved with it in Oxford. And he talked about how in Oxford at the time um, that it was founded in the 40s, there are all kinds of special interest affinity groups that you could find at Oxford. Of course, it was pre-internet days, so people had to find entertain, entertaining things to do, uh, uh, often uh, uh, in the evenings. And so the Socratic Club, uh, the Oxford Socratic Club met once a week, and they had uh, famous um, scholars, philosophers, literary uh, folks, um, uh, theologians, uh, 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 and including not only theists but also atheists, where uh, they were able to uh, address these issues of, of Christianity in a public forum in a way that involved uh, honest looking at available arguments. So we continue that tradition here. As I said, uh, we meet about once a month during the academic year, so eight times a year. This is the concluding meeting of the 15th year of the Gonzaga Socratic Club. I can hardly believe myself that it's been going on this long. Uh, but it is uh, a bit hoary and at least we'll say old and dignified, perhaps. Um, I do look for the opportunity to uh, share ideas from interesting folks uh, here at Gonzaga and also from uh, places far flung. Uh, we, we certainly enjoy the opportunity when we have uh, scholars from, uh, from home here that are able to present, and that's the case tonight. Uh, I think all of us know that, uh, that our lives are shaped by, and indeed we might say they are, they are afflicted by technology and noise, which I think are two related things, right? Technology introduces noise into our lives in the sense of uh, what I mean by that is background noise, right? Where there's always something that we can hear, there's always something that technology is presenting to us, whether it's the tones of a ringing cell phone or uh, the chirp of a, of a uh, chat message on your computer or whatever, right? There's always something going on. And our speaker today is going to try to uh, reach way back and look at resources that we might have for thinking about our lives uh, in, a, in an increasingly technological age. So our speaker is uh, Richard Goodrich from the Gonzaga History Department. And he's going to be reaching back, as I said, to the Desert Fathers uh, for wisdom about the Internet age. So if you would, uh, help me welcome Richard Goodrich. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to be here. This is my first time actually addressing the Gonzaga Socratic Club. And of course, when I was invited to do it, I thought, but I'm just a simple historian. What did I have to say to philosophers and theologians? But as it turned out, I was just completing a book at the same time was a new Latin translation of some of the works of the Desert Fathers, some of the same, which we'll talk about a little bit here in a minute. And it struck me that this would be an ideal opportunity to dig into the question of, two things really, can the Desert Fathers help us 
but maybe some of the pressing issues of our day. And realistically, as we enter the 21st century, as we enter an electronic enhanced generation, is there any room for ancient wisdom? Does it still make sense? So without further ado, we'll begin. In the mid-fourth century, the Roman world witnessed one of the strangest phenomena of its arguably 1,100-year history. Men and women, Christians, who were to all outward appearances sane, sensible, and sober, began to abandon the towns and villages of Rome and head out into the Egyptian desert. Some settled in newly established colonies along the Nile River. Others chose to live alone, away from the river, out where the fertile Nile Delta moves into the, the Sahara, very difficult environment. And here, separated from the rest of the world, these ascetic pioneers devoted themselves to a single-minded search for God. Now, as I said, this was a, a strange phenomenon in that Christianity had just won. 300 years of persecution, Constantine and Licinius come on the scene and tolerate Christianity. And with a nice push from the emperor and his sons and those who came after, Christianity was becoming the dominant religion. And so here we have a situation where having just won, suddenly Christians turn their back on that and flee out into the desert. Word of the new movement spread, and it grew rapidly. Um, a very famous bishop of, of Alexandria named Athanasius wrote a book in 356 called The Life of St. Anthony. And this was about the, quote, unquote, founder of the movement. Uh, this burst of publicity has led many to regard Anthony as the father of monasticism. In other words, the first guy to actually go out and do that. In reality, he's probably the most famous example of early monasticism. He certainly wasn't the first ascetic or the first man to actually go out into the desert. But because of this big public relations coup, he's the one we talk about <coughs> think about. And, oops, what is it there? Oh, sorry. There he is. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Now, according to Athanasius, Anthony had been raised in an upper middle class Egyptian family. His father was a minor landowner. And unfortunately, while he was a teenager, when he was a teenager, both of his parents died. And this left him as the sole heir to a small, a small piece of land and responsibility for his younger sister. The story goes that one Sunday morning, Anthony went to church, and there the priest was working through the gospel and <coughs> came across this very famous passage of Matthew 19. If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. His words changed Anthony's life. He felt as though they'd been spoken directly to him, and he decided to do something about it. He sold his property, gave the proceeds to the poor, placed his sister in a community of women. Athanasius does not receive for her response to this, it doesn't seem like he gave her much of a choice, just put her in there. And then he moved out into the desert and began to pursue the ascetic lifestyle, seeking God in the great silence of the desert. Now again, we probably would never have heard anything about Anthony had it not been for Athanasius. Athanasius wrote this biography, and it was a book that was filled with all sorts of miraculous tales, beginning with move into the desert, his 20-year struggle with demons, and finally his emergence from that struggle as a perfected human. Thin volume was originally written in Greek, but it was rapidly translated into other languages, including Latin, and became a bestseller for its day. It would have been the top on the New York Times bestseller list, and Oprah certainly would have selected it for her <laughs> book club had she been around there. Scribes turned out thousands of copies, and the stories about Anthony and his associates circulated widely through the empire. The book altered lives wherever it was read, and I want to emphasize this. Fifty years after its publication, for instance, St. Augustine, in his Confessions, would record a story 
about two young men, men me, he met in Trier, um, where the Roman court was. These two men had been ambitious functionaries, and they wanted to rise in the service of the emperor and become bureaucrats, mid-level bureaucrats, that one day they're in a garden, and they happen to come across a copy of St. Anthony. They read the work and have a life-changing moment, which Augustine describes. Tell me, I ask you, one of the men said to his companion, what do we hope to accomplish with all of our work? What do we seek? For what cause do we fight? Is it really better to place our hope in the palace, to count on becoming friends with the emperor? Isn't that a position that is fragile and filled with danger? Doesn't such a perilous path present even greater dangers? When will we reach that point? Nevertheless, if we want to, we can become a friend of God right now. And according to Augustine, these two men were so inspired by what they had read and this epiphany that they had received from the book that they renounced their careers, built a monastery right outside the city walls of Trier, where Augustine claims that he had met them. After Anthony's death in 356, the desert um, became, in the words of Palladius, another um, contemporary writer, the desert became a city. Thousands and thousands of men and women flocked out to the desert. And I have a fairly poor map of Egypt here. But the main colonies, uh, the Nitrian Desert, the further desert of Sketis, and then you also had monastic communities up and down the Nile River. And this was essentially the heartland of the early experience. Egypt was the spiritual core of the People left the cities, they flocked out um, to the desert and formed colonies out there. I have to, one of the things I, I think is very important to emphasize is this was a popular movement. Okay, which I don't want to say it was mass hysteria, it certainly wasn't that. They're very serious people. But you know, you know how things get popular. Well, this got popular at that time. Let's go out into the desert and become you know, monks and nuns. People wanted something more, and they found it in this very unlikely spot. The fourth century was the golden age of monasticism in Egypt. Um, at the beginning of the fifth, and around the year 407, the Mazikis, a, a people from the east, what is now modern-day Libya, uh, came sweeping across Egypt. They marauded, they hit and run raids, and ultimately they attacked the um, the foundation at Sketis and destroyed it and drove the monks away. When Sketis fell, Arsenius departed weeping, saying, the world has lost Rome and the monks have lost Sketis. So the monks were driven out of Egypt. Many of them resettled in Palestine, and in this new land, they collected and shared stories about their illustrious forebears. So the very famous monks of the fourth and early fifth century Stories were grouped together about them. Sayings of the Desert Fathers and anonymous authors and editors began to arrange these stories into collections. And we have thousands of these, by the way. And there are all kinds of interesting things. I like this one a lot. Um, <laughs> Abba had aspiring to silence, placed a stone in his mouth for three years and learned how to control his tongue by doing so. Some very practical advice here. <laughs> Problem. Okay. Well, after a long and, I should say, in modern scholarship, hotly disputed story of transmission, we arrived at some major collections. And I should say, this is a very difficult topic, and we do, do several lectures about this, so I'm just going to give you a quick Reader's Digest version. Essentially, you have two main, main traditions, the Greek tradition and the Latin tradition. Um, the most famous of the Greek traditions is the alphabetical collection. And this is just chapter after chapter of little stories that we call the Apothegum, the Apothegmata Patrum, the sayings of the fathers, um, and are arranged by the monk to whom they are attributed. We also have a large Greek systematic collection, and here uh, the stories are arranged topically. So stories about lust, stories about thoughts, um, stories wealth and avarice are all grouped together. And then we have an extremely large collection 
which is called the anonymous collection simply because it doesn't have uh, any names attached to it. The stories are anonymous. On the Latin side, you've got a systematic collection ascribed to Pelagius and John, two 5th century deacons who ultimately became uh, popes in theory. And then from the far western edge of the empire in what's now modern day Portugal, you've got a systematic collection of Pascasius and Dumium and a systematic collection by Martin of Braga, uh, two people you will not have heard probably much about. These collections were treasured by monks and laity, and for really the next thousand years, they're going to be core to the monastic experience in both the Greek East and the Latin West. Monastic legislators, including John Cassian, anonymous master, Saint Benedict, will draw heavily upon what is contained in his collections. And through the medieval period, you have small collections that are used by laity. For centuries, the Desert Fathers represented the highest ideal of Christian spirituality, exemplars of what humans could achieve if they devoted themselves wholeheartedly to the pursuit of God. Today, however, as with much wisdom from their past, their ideas are largely forgotten. One reason, of course, is for the uncompromising rigor of their views. They have some pretty strong opinions of what you're going to, what you're going to need to do if you are going to follow Christ, then you need to follow Christ, and this might represent some sacrifice in your life. If there was a prime directive to the thinking of the Desert Fathers, I would say it's this one, which we all know. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, with all your strength, with all your understanding. Love your neighbor as yourself. So, like the ancient philosophers, the Desert Fathers were interested in what was the good life, and how do we achieve the good life? They came to different answers than some of the other ancient philosophers. And so I would like to, in a, period, a paper of this length, I really cannot unpack all their, their thinking. That would take weeks of lectures, I fear. But I want to focus on one small corner of their thought, and that is the battle against distractions. We are, I will argue, rapidly becoming, if we are not already, an internet-enhanced people. We are confronted with a level of distraction from our technology that was inconceivable in the fourth century. The Desert Fathers recognized the destructive and disruptive power of the limited range of distractions that they faced, and what happens when those distractions are essentially on steroids, as what we face. So are our distractions a danger to our mental health and spiritual life? I'm going to argue that indeed they are, and a little bit about how the Desert Fathers thought about distractions, and that's going to be the major focus of where we're going tonight. However, in parallel is going to be my sub theme, which is simply this 20 or this fourth century wisdom is still relevant even in the 21st century. We haven't really moved beyond needing them, their help at this time. Can the Desert Fathers offer us any? So, part one. Why did the earliest ascetics leave the security of home and heart to pursue God in the wilderness? What was it about the desert that helped? Now, this is a question with several answers, and again, I can't dive into them. But ultimately, if you were to distill everything down, I think, at its heart, you would find the proposition that we can't begin to pursue God spiritual way until we've eliminated distractions from our lives. If distractions separate us from God. Our world, both then and now, assaults us with distractions. Um, and I want to, again, preface my remarks by noting that the saints of the Desert Fathers are not a systematic collection of wisdom. So it is not it's like they have a well-worked-out theology, but um, I'm going to try to systemize it a little bit for you. Um, so I think you can talk about distractions on three levels. And at the very base level is what I'm going to call contact distractions. Distractions that just normally occur in our day-to-day -day life as we're moving through the world. Uh, you're walking down a street and you see somebody from the opposite sex and you're attracted to them and you know, you're distracted. Lust comes into your mind. You weren't seeking this experience 
but it's thrust upon you by my contact with the world. Um, I have to say, there's a fabulous quote here. There aren't many apothegms, sayings attributed to women. So I'm always interested when we have women on this one. And this is a fabulous one, of course, I'm too. A monk saw a group of nuns coming down the road toward him. He immediately turned his back on them so that his eyes wouldn't be tempted by lust. Good monk, right? As the nuns passed, their abbess said to him, if you were a true monk, you wouldn't have even noticed we were there. <laughs> the doughty abbess, I call her. Yes, um, that's how to take care of but of course, contact disruptions are far more than simply lust. You're walking through town, and you see an ice cream shop, and wow, suddenly I want ice cream. Whatever. Uh, you weren't intending to stop for a cone, but there it is. Inexplicably, you do. You're watching television, you see the new Jaguar XK, whatever it is on the television, and oh, have to have that car. I love that car. Can't get that car out of my mind. Sitting there on my computer, and the email goes off. Oh no, it pings. What am I going to do? Of course, I've got to check it immediately and find out what in the world is going on, even though I know it's going to be for my boss and wanting me to do something between tonight when I'm off work and tomorrow morning. Uh, the dinner dishes need to be washed. The term paper needs to be written. The list of potential distractions we find in the world are almost infinite. All around us are distractions. And those of us who remain in the world endure a fairly relentless barrage of distractions simply because we're in constant contact with them. Fathers believe that if they could place themselves in an environment that limited this contact, cut themselves off from most of the distractions, you're already a step ahead of the game. Okay? So retreat to the desert, put yourself in a cell, focus your mind on God. And then you're not going to have these things experience. You're experiencing things. They use the analogy of death. So I become as I'm dead to the world. I do not exist anymore. The dead don't care about new car models, we postulate at least. Uh, they don't hunger for gelato. They have certainly no interest in emails from their boss. And they don't care about the distractions of the living. We become dead to the world. And this was a very common uh, idea in the Desert Fathers. One day, a magistrate came to the desert, bringing a senator's will to Abba Arsenius. The senator, a member of his family, had left him a very large inheritance. Arsenius took the will and was about to destroy it. No. The magistrate threw himself at his feet, saying, I beg you, do not destroy it, or they'll cut off my head. Arsenius said to him, but I was dead long before this senator who has just died. And he returned the will to the magistrate without accepting anything. I have cut myself off from the world. I no longer have an interest in what is being left to me. I sever my connection to the world and, in very real respect, try to emulate the dead. Abba Moses said, The man who flees and lives in solitude is like a bunch of grapes ripened by the sun, but he who remains among men is like an unripened grape. So if you're in contact with the world, continually distracted by the demands of the world, how can you possibly begin to make progress? You'll remain an unbreaking great. So, we think that sounds great. Let's retreat from the world, cut off all those distractions, but as the Desert Fathers knew very well, you many times take the world with you. And this was the experience, because memory and imagination come with us. St. Jerome, who had a great memory and was very imaginative, um, talks about his travails in the deserts of Syria. <laughs> How often, I should emphasize Jerome always goes um, for the drama. How often, when I was living in the desert, in the vast solitude which gives to hermits a savage dwelling place, parched by a burning sun, how often did I fancy myself among the pleasures of Rome? So here he is, he's out there in the desert, his limbs are being scorched by the sun, but his mind is going back to the delights of Rome. I used to sit alone because I was filled with bitterness. Sackcloth disfigured my unshapely limbs, and my skin from long neglect had become as black as an Ethiopian's. 
Tears and groans were every day my portion, and if sleep happened to overpower my struggles against it, my bare bones, which barely held together, hardly held together, clashed against the ground. So here he's just trying to stay awake in full sleep. Falls on the ground. That's terrible. Of my food and drink I say nothing, for even in sickness the solitaries have nothing but cold water, and to eat cooked food is regarded as an indulgence. Now, although in my fear of hell I had consigned myself to this prison where I had no companions but scorpions and wild beasts, I often found myself amid troops of dancing girls. My face was pale, my frame chilled with fasting, yet my mind was burning with desire, and the fires of lust kept bubbling up before me when my flesh was as good as dead. So here we've left the world, but Jerome can't help the fact that his mind keeps going back to what he had known as a student when he was living in the city of Rome. The allure and charms of the cities and the dancing girls. Memory and imagination. They came with the monks into the desert. And this represents essentially a second level of distraction. Saint Anthony. He, Anthony said also, he who wishes to live in solitude in the desert is delivered for three conflicts, hearing, speaking, and seeing. There's only one conflict for him, and that is with his thoughts. So we still carry quite a load with us, even when we manage to cut off the distractions of the world. So even though a person retreats from the world, it's virtually impossible to eradicate the thoughts that come with you, produced by memory and imagination. So this intermittent mental dialogue accompanies, accompanies us everywhere we go, and it's a second level of distraction. Now, if that isn't enough, there is a third level that the Desert Fathers recognized, and that is at the level of the demons. So the Desert Fathers believed that there were external agents, demonic forces, that were also actively conspiring against them. You don't have to read very far in the literature of the desert to realize that they view this as a very real thing. <coughs> they were in constant conflict with the demonic. The demon's primary purpose is to distract our attention away from the contemplation of God. And that's what demons do. One of the fathers prayed to God to see the demons. He received an answer. You have no need to see them. The elder asked again, saying, Lord, you are able to protect me with your grace. Then God unveiled his eyes, and the elder saw the demons. They were like bees buzzing around a man and gnashing their teeth over him. But the angels of the Lord were rebuking them. So in the Desert Father's model, we also exist in a spiritual battlefield in which demons, our adversaries, are essentially attacking us as much as they can. And there's a very common image that the Desert Fathers have of demons sitting there and lobbing darts or flaming arrows, thoughts, at the monk or the nun. Um, demons cannot physically assault a human, the Desert Fathers thought, but they can introduce thoughts into your mind. And this is how they get to them. They are constant companions and antagonists of the monks. They study the likes and the dislikes of each individual and tailor the thoughts that they launch at the Desert Father to produce maximum distraction. Evagrius Ponticus gives us a bit of theology here. The words we utter and the movements our body make are signs of the passions of the soul. Through these external signs, the demons perceive whether we have focused on the thought that they have planted in us and bring it forth, or to the contrary, through concern for the salvation, through our concern for salvation, reject it. So the demons can't read your mind. They can't tell if they're achieving anything but they monitor you, they study your reactions. And this gives them clues about whether they're <clears throat> successful or not. They want to lead you astray, and they want to lead you into temptation, actual sin, a rejection of God, and if they can't achieve that, then in the words of John Cassian, harmful lukewarmness or a deadly feeling of hopelessness. Okay, so three levels of distraction. Contact distractions, distractions of our memory and imagination, and finally an active external agent that is attacking you. How in the world does this have anything to do with our, our situation? Um, the Desert Fathers never imagined, 
radical new technology like the internet or social media, the things that our computer technology brings to us. Nevertheless, I would argue you can also schematize in this desert father layout sort of thing. So I've already alluded to how the demands of the world contact distractions are facilitated by technology. You're, you're um, supposed to be off the clock, but your boss shoots you an email about a concern you need to address now. Your phone goes off while you're doing something else. You get a phone call, a text message during dinner. Technology, especially in the, in the terms of cell phones, opens you up to a wide variety of distractions simply because you take your source of distractions everywhere you go. You have it with you all the time. It's always a distraction. On the next level are distractions that we seek, distractions that appeal to memory and imagination, I suppose. Um, an internet para parallel would be something like web just simple web pages that we find. I do not know if you share this problem or not. But sometimes I wake up in the morning and I think, I wonder what's going on in the news. And I go and I click on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, the New York Times, and the next thing I know, an hour and a half has simply vanished. Isn't that amazing? Where did all that time go? Forty, yeah, an hour and a half I drag my dopamine addled brain clear of the morass. I don't know what's gone. I get back to work, and then a half hour later, I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if something's changed. I better go check. <laughs> Has this ever happened to any of you? OK, I see some nods. Is this a problem? Yeah, of course it is. Back when the internet and the World Wide Web were just getting started, and I have to say, I'm going to come off sounding like I hate technology, but I began uh, my post my early working life as a computer systems engineer, and so I was in the dark, you know, inside of dark, darkness and evil for many, many years. Uh, I was on the internet back when it was an ARPA debt, okay, back in the 80s before, you know, way back. Um, so it's not that I'm a Luddite, although I'm becoming one rapidly. It's just, you know. When it was first getting started, web pages were extraordinarily primitive. Okay, you could throw something up, it wasn't very sophisticated. You'd end up getting long pages of empty text, and then, wow, innovation. We could put a picture on there with all that text, and that was a radical step forward. Um, but that, of course, has all changed. And so you've got um, web pages are a sophisticated entertainment media. They can distract us literally for hours at a time as we sit there, click and click and click and click, and keep following our mouse around all kinds of interesting sites. At the moment, I would argue that things like web pages and web servers that you might find on something like CNN are still relatively unsophisticated. They will get better at knowing you and knowing what you like and drawing you in and sucking you in. But I think still web page technology is a bit, it's, it needs work still. It is going to achieve maximum distraction. It's getting there. Don't worry about it. It's, it's moving that way. But I would say where we may seriously worrying advances are things like social media and online gaming. And these are absolutely terrifying. I would say they essentially are the closest parallels to what um, the Desert Fathers regarded as demonic. And at that, it comes and gets you. It is, it, like demons, um, social media monitors us, monitors us, optimizes the experience for each individual. So when we experience social media, give me an example in a minute, it's different from each one of us. Because the computer is watching you. And the computer knows what you like. And the computer tests, the algorithm tests what you like. What's it designed to do? You just spend more time staring at your phone, staring at your computer, logging in. I want to share this uh, really great video. This is a name, some of you may have heard. B.F. Skinner. Anybody recognize B.F. Skinner? Ah, oh, B.F. Skinner. He was amazing. A um, <laughs> long time ago, back in the dark ages, uh, in the 20th century. B.F. Skinner came up with operative conditioning, which was a way to get animals and other sentient beings to do things that he wanted them to do through a series of training exercises. And this is a very short little clicker. I just want to show it to you because it's uh, fascinating. It's nostalgic and it's scary. And we're going to try another pigeon now. And uh, 
I will try to pick out some particular pattern of behavior and uh, make it uh, more, a, a more frequent part of the repertoire of the bird. Right on. The bird is, uh, has been uh, already conditioned to eat when the, when the magazine sounds and the light flashes. Now we'll just watch its behavior a bit. It's not doing anything in particular, you see. Well, I'm going to try to get it to do something. Suppose I shape up the behavior of making a complete turn. What I do is simply as I did then to wait for some part of that uh, behavior. There's more of it, you see. Well, you can see the effect is instantaneous. I'm waiting for it to turn counterclockwise now. And I reinforce that movement. And I wait for a more pronounced movement than that. It's got to be more than that. There we go, all the way around. <laughs> so there's B.F. Skinner <laughs> teaching a pigeon to do exactly what he wants. Um, I'm sure that most of us identify with B.F. Skinner. You shouldn't. <laughs> you should be identifying with the pigeon. <laughs> that's what's happening. That's exactly what is happening. Video might strike you as amusing, quaint, and old-fashioned. It should terrify you. Um, each user of social media has an individual profile. And that profile is created and used by the algorithm behind it. And there's, <coughs> it's not you know, hidden secret information. Social media addiction is a bigger problem than you can think. This came from an article in Computer World in 2015. You're not alone. Social network is engineered to be as habit-forming as crack cocaine can. And the way this works is there's an algorithm behind it, watching everything you do, evaluating what you like and what you don't like. So if you're sitting there, I don't know what form of social media you're on, and the Kardashians come on, if you're me, you beat that, get rid of that. It's not going to show me that again. It's going to show me something I like. And it's going to continue to develop its profile until it can maximize the amount of time I'm dialed in. And that's the goal. When I'm not thinking about history, I have a, a, active, active career. I have a very strong interest, I should say, in photography. And so as most photographers like, we want to sell our photographs to other people. And a few years ago, you probably recall, this social media experiment called Instagram came on. How many of you are on Instagram? Okay, quite a lot of people. And I, you know, I bought into it. I thought, this is great. I'll be on Instagram. I'll get 10,000 followers. They'll love my photos. And I'll, you know, first of all, I'll be able to sell tons and tons of photos because everybody will want to go buy these great photos they're seeing on Instagram. <laughs> And I'll become a, an ambassador for Nikon or Leica or something, and big camera companies will send me to exotic <laughs> locations because I'll be so important in the Instagram world. And I thought, that sounds terrific. So I got into it. I started doing this. And I realized there was a problem. And that was Instagram doesn't really give me a way to send people from my Instagram feed to my gallery where I sell pictures. Now, you could put a little hyperlink in there. This would be great. And if I had a picture, I could have a little caption and say, click here and go buy this picture. If you want a copy for your wall, that would be terrific. And all the photographers worldwide were you know, filing petitions with Instagram. Please, please, please put in this desperately needed feature. And Instagram never did it and still has not done it. Why? It took me a while to think about this. But when you think about it, it's obvious. If we get on a hyperlink, and go somewhere else, you're not in Instagram anymore. You're not in Instagram. You're somewhere else. And the last thing Instagram wants you to do is go somewhere else. They want you right where they got you. They never put this feature in, which would be incredibly valuable. March 2016, it's a terrible year for many people, Instagram rolled out the new algorithm. They were very proud of this on from the Instagram blog. To improve your experience, your feed will soon be ordered to show the moments that we believe you will care about the most. The order of photos and videos in your feed will be based on the likelihood you'll be interested in the content 
your relationship with the person posting the timeliness of the post. In other words, the computer is going to show you what you're going to like. In the old days, pre-March 2016, it was simply the people you followed in reverse chronological order. Okay? So as people posted, as you would go look, you would see them just in the order that they'd been posted. But no, now Instagram, the algorithm, is finding photos that you will like. Why? What was wrong with the old way? People were rebellion about this. This was terrible. But it's pretty simple, really. <laughs> the longer Instagram has your eyes in its app, the more ads they can show you. When you distill it down, Instagram is no different than television. They're showing you advertisements, and that's how they're making their money. The longer you're sitting there looking at your feed, the more, the more ads you see, the more they can charge their advertisers, the more opportunities you have. And so they're going to try to find media that will command your attention as long as possible. And keep your mind in there. How effective is this? Instagram is on track to become the world's largest social media company. The company does not reveal annual revenue, but Wall Street analysts believe they're in $4 billion from advertising in 2017. And the projection is it will earn $10 billion in 2019. Rapid, rapid growth. It has more than 1 billion users. It's used by 35% of American adults and 63% of American teenagers. 60% of the active users use the app every day. 38 check the app more than once a day. The average user of Android <coughs> Instagram uses it for 53 minutes a day. 53 minutes staring into your Instagram app. That's just Instagram. <clears throat> Study came out in January. Uh, the Philippines topped the World <coughs> Internet Usage Index average 10 hours a day. Think about that. The average person in the Philippines is looking or using the internet in one way or another 10 hours a day. How many hours are you awake a day? <laughs> Uh, interesting. This is, I thought this was fascinating. Uh, Japan comes in last. Now only about three hours a day. I always think of Japan as being you know, high tech. You know, they're always on the cutting edge of technology. And you would think, no, they're not, actually. Uh, United States, around six and a half hours a day. Are we distracted yet? Is this a problem? It gets worse. <laughs> As if your phone is not um, adequate to distract you, Elon Musk has a division of his company called Neuralink, which is working on a chip that will be implanted in your brain and will have you connected 24 hours a day. This isn't science fiction. This is a real division of Elon Musk's company working on this project. Yeah, OK. There we go. Um, I could have, and I was going to throw up just a massive list of studies for the last 10 years of the perils of internet addiction and how this has become a huge problem for us, but I think you probably already know that. Let's finish out with a little bit of thinking about the desert. So, the Desert Fathers identified thoughts and distractions as a barrier between Christians and God, spiritual progress. And I've argued that modern technology is an incredibly powerful catalyst for this. It takes what they experienced, what has been experienced in all of right up to the beginning of the 21st century, and it just converts. It's, it's, a, it's a rapid explosion. Um, the world's moved on. We're no longer fourth century Romans, however. Maybe you embrace Elon Musk's idea of becoming cyborgs and have chips in your brain, and you mean kind of connection with that. So can the Desert Fathers help us? No. Um, I think that the Desert Fathers can help us think clearly about our relationship with God and the world around us, our relationship with reality and strategies to help us should we prove dissatisfied with either of these. The Desert Fathers drew a very strong line between what was real and what was illusory. What is real, what is not. God is real, God is eternal. 
The world around us, our concerns, our cares, are unreal, fleeting, and transitory. In a month, we'll have forgotten most of the things that are distract distracting us today. In 20 years, most of you will not remember you were at this lecture. Okay? These things pass away. In a thousand years, none of us will be concerned um, that our, our, our lives will be forgotten, and the dead, as I said earlier, do not pray to walk to. So why are we so distracted with things that are so what separated the Desert Fathers from the rest of society and from us is the simple fact they made a deliberate choice to focus their attention on what they considered reality. And reality for them was God. And to disregard unreality. And if I was going to distill the entire Desert Father experience down into a single sentence, it would be they chose to orient their lives around God. What was real and permanent, rather than what was unreal. Transitory. Imagine just for a moment a little thought experience. You've experiment, excuse me. You've gone down to the beach and you're standing there and you're looking at the Pacific Ocean and it's vast, it's amazing. It's maybe one of the closest things we have to a sense of eternal. And you've driven all the way from Spokane, it's taking you eight hours to get down there, and there you are, there's the beach. You're looking, you're looking out at the waves coming in, sunset, it's beautiful, it's it's overwhelming. Do you turn around? and stare at the cars in the parking lot. You don't. You look at the water. And this was what the desert was navigated. What are you going to look at? Are you going to look at what's real and what is eternal? Or are you going to be distracted by what is unreal? <laughs> Fix your thoughts on God. Orient your selves towards reality. Um, When Abba Agathon was asked which great virtue required the most work in the life of man, he responded, I maintain that there is no greater labor than to pray to God. Because as often as a man wants to pray, his enemies hurry to impede him, knowing that nothing confounds them more than prayer. Nevertheless, whenever a man chooses life and he is able to maintain his decision, he will possess rest. Of course, the demons will struggle to impede prayer to the end of his life, and the work to resist them is difficult. For it's not a small battle to pray with the demons resisting and prohibiting, or to come to prayer with men standing and opposing you on all sides. So exert yourselves, my little sons, in your prayers to drive off the contrary and malignant demons. The value of the ancient wisdom, the value of the Apostle Mata Pata, the sayings of the Desert Fathers, is it serves as a mirror and an icon for our lives. It is a mirror that we look into and we see ourselves. And we ask ourselves. Are, what are our spiritual struggles based in? Now, tonight I've argued that distractions are a major problem that we face. And you do not have to be a Christian to be worried about this. If you want to have a clear mind to be able to think with attention, our distractions are killing that possibility, in my view. So what do we do about it? Are we going to move out to caves in Nevada and start new desert communities? Well, Maybe, but maybe we don't have to be so extreme. We could do something revolutionary like selecting times when we turn off our phones. Did you know your phone has a power switch on it? What a design flaw. Who was thinking about that? <laughs> because you can actually not just mute it, you can turn the silly thing off completely. Maybe you want to do that. Every Sunday, you could say, I'm not going to have any electronic distractions today. All my computers. Tablets, turn them off. What would that look like? Would that do something for you? We could create small technolo technology free spaces within the rhythm of our lives, and rather than filling that space with other distractions, we could get back to put spiritual tools that have worked time in and again. Uh, prayer, meditation, study of scripture. Creating an opening, and you might find God slipping in through it. The Desert Fathers are a mirror. They encourage us to reflect upon our lives. And they are also, I would argue, textual icons. They point the way. And so as just as with an icon in the Orthodox tradition, you pray, look at it and through it, they draw us in, engage our minds, and encourage us to move ever deeper into the experience of the eternal. Tonight I've focused on one small aspect of the teachings of the Desert Fathers. Months of lectures would not exhaust the possibilities. They remain very valuable for anyone 
interested in the spiritual life, even in an internet enhanced age. Once the Holy Fathers prophesied about the final generation, one of them, a man with extraordinary lifestyle named Asterion, said, We still keep the commands of God. And the other fathers asked him, What about those who will come after us? Asterion responded, Perhaps they'll fulfill half the commands. Then they asked, The generations after them, what will they do? He replied, The men of those generations will not carry out God's commands. Temptation will come upon them, but those who are found to have been approved in the face of this temptation will be even better than us or our fathers. Thank you. Our practice at the Socratic Club is often to have a commentator respondent to highlight important ideas in a talk and to invite further conversation. This. Uh, for our session today, uh, Dr. Eric Cunningham, also of the Gonzaga History Department, has a few remarks. Thank you very much. Um, so th uh, this is always a pleasure to be at the Socratic Club. I think I've been here about half a dozen times, often in this, uh, uh, I think, the, the more desirable position of being a, a commentator. I don't have to work too hard on presenting um, my, my ideas. Uh, the, the, the downside of that is I, I was uh, Richard works across the hall from, from me, and I, I actually got a preview copy of this. I know what he's going to say, but none of it was surprising. And, and it's often the case here that when I'm commenting to give a comment or rebuttal or anything, I rarely have anything to rebut. I, I agree essentially with everything. Uh, the premises, the conclusions, the, the idea of a textual icon is especially um, interesting. But as all of these topics, I mean, these are, this is a very important topic, uh, the, this, this whole notion of the Desert Fathers and their practice and the questions they ask about the world, the assumptions they make about the world. These aren't just questions about lifestyles. Why wouldn't it be fun to be a monk in the desert? No, 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 I'd rather live in the city. No, I'd rather have a hut to the mountain. Oh, much more interesting. And these are, these are, what's at stake in these questions is salvation of our souls. So these are, you know, the, the only real thing, the, the real thing is God, and reality is that which brings you closer to God. And, um, and when I, I think back about this, this whole topic, I've got a, several things that I started with, and I, I boiled it down to a few points, so I won't be, I won't be long here. But the, the topic itself is, a, is something of great interest to me. This is my, my introduction to this topic was, uh, Thomas Merton's Wisdom in the Desert. Uh, he was a great fan of the Desert Fathers. Also of the, uh, the Zen monks of, of Japan and China. And I'm pretty sure reading this book, this, this is uh, dated to 1987, uh, when I was a lieutenant aboard the USS Gridley, and I carried this book with me to my third deployment to the Indian Ocean. Um, and I think this helped get me through it. Um, this, but the, the, and I think also the introduction to Zen did much to bring me into my present life, which is a, a teacher of Japanese history in Gonzaga. So um, I, I get, for, for 30 years now, the, the Desert Fathers have been something of a preoccupation, if not an obsession. So let me just, just start by saying that was a, a, a fine, splendid talk, and I, I think I would agree with most of your positions on it. There's a few things I would add, I mean, or to, to complexify it or to ask a few questions. And I'm not sure I'm as much, uh, I was an engineer in my day, too, not a computer person, but um, I'm, I'm far from being a Luddite. Um, but but the, the, the question, I think, is, I, when I remember back in my youth, I wanted to be a, a, a hermit of some kind, a, a, an urban secular monk where, you know, I could run around and, and be self-renouncing. I think I read... Uh, Somerset Mom's uh, The Razor's Edge, and that was my mom. I wanted to be Larry Darrell, and by golly, I was going to do it. Mostly it was, a, it was an international pub crawl. Uh, when, I, when I really look at my, my spiritual journey, I was just a young guy who didn't have much furniture, and I don't know if I can add much more to that as far as uh, my, my spiritual evolution. But I think um, you know the unplugging thing was something that had great appeal to me. Uh, I personally found that God has a strange way of bringing us to that environment that is most salubrious for us. The, the, that, that environment that will help us gain salvation, and it may be a desert, and it may be on the faculty of a university, 
and it may be, uh, I don't know, I, I don't, it's probably not watching YouTube for 10 hours a day in the Philippines, but you don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure about that. Um, because when we unplug, well, the unplugging can I mean, the, the Desert Fathers are, give us good examples of this too. At a certain point, if they unplugged, they got out of the city, they went to the desert. And then we, we will say this to ourselves, all I need is uh, just a good ocean cruise and I'll be just fine. All I need is a weekend at the coast, get away, unplug, get my weekend at the coast, I'll, I'll, and I'll set the world back to rights. All I need is a, a good book and a, a glass of brandy by the fireplace and I'll be just fine. No, 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 all I need is I need a cave in the Egyptian desert and then I'll be fine. <laughs> uh, my little mountain top hut, then I'll be fine. We, when you read these these stories of the fathers, they weren't fine, right? even in the desert. They were having, a, these guys were fighting over the turnips. I mean, who, who, who's, who's been eating more carrots this week and much less gossip about him? Oh, Father, I've sinned. I gossiped about a guy eating turnips. Yeah, so stop doing that. And so basically, they're dealing with very, very human problems. And I think that's why it's so charming and why we really can learn so much from them. Um, you know, the, the unplugging, we did some unplugging. We do it every year. We, we take a technology fest in my home for Lent. And it is, it's wonderful to come home. Um, and, and at night, my kids are not sitting around uh, you know, playing Minecraft on the computer or watching teenage girls having skittle eating contests on YouTube. You know, but you can watch this for 10 hours a day if you have a mind. Uh, the, the, it's, a, it's actually amazing what you can find on, on YouTube. Um, but I, I, my, they're, they're all huddled around the dining room table painting pictures and drawing, and it's a wonderful thing. And I can't, the first thought I had uh, one afternoon was seeing my, my two sons, James and Fred, ages eight and six, and they're, they're, they're fighting over the, the better paintbrush. And it reminded me of St. Therese of Lisieux, who apparently had something of a flap, you know, that this doctor of the church and a saint and the little flower of Jesus uh, was very much bent out of shape when he found, she found one of the nuns using her favorite paintbrush when she went into the recreation room of the convent. Right? So you you can't get away. You you can't unplug. Right? You can't unplug. I, I have absolutely no problem with people trashing my paintbrushes. So but I would hardly say that I'm uh, elevated above the little flower. Um, but when you unplug, what are you doing? You you unplug and you unplug and you unplug and you unplug. Eventually. Uh, you're confronted um, with the greatest distraction of them all, which is our existence, really, like Father Anthony, being alone in the class. And goodness, what could be worse than that? Um, but that, that is where we are. And, and so this, this, you know, when I got to thinking about this, I, I got to thinking about uh, Dr. Goodrich's comment about Elon Musk. And I guess I'm something of a Musk fan. Um, the, the, the Neuralink is definitely creepy and weird. But I think in his defense, which is something I'm not rushing to do, you know, the, the Neuralink is actually supposed to be a human interface for what he sees is an absolutely demonic AI coming to, to take us over. So, I mean, Musk, for, for his quirks, thinks that if there's some human interface to the, to the matrix, then there's some hope for redemption. Other than that, he holds out very little. Now, Elon Musk, as you may know, um, also buys into the theory that was put forth by um, Professor Nick Boston back in the, uh, I don't know, 2003 or 2004, the simulation hypothesis. If you're familiar with that, it's, it's you know, very briefly, um, assuming that Moore's law is correct, that our processing, computer processing speeds will increase exponentially, the day will come when we can produce a virtual reality that's indistinguishable from the reality we're in. So the question, what's reality? What is reality? We don't know. Um, so, so what would the reality of Musk and, and Bostrom first said this, that okay, there, are, there are three propositions, assuming that Moore's law is correct, then in the future, one of them must be true, in the future we'll just destroy ourselves before we become smart enough to create perfect virtual realities that we can inhabit and not know that they're real or false. The second proposition, we do become smart enough to create such realities, but we're so smart that we're living like uh, angels in heaven, and we're, we don't need to run any dumb computer games about what it might be like to be an undergraduate at Gonzaga back in the year 2019. So we, we leave the games to the side, and then we pursue, we, we pursue uh, the beatific vision full time. 
And then the third probability is, given our nature that we really do like games, and we really do like what are scenarios, and we really do like to play, gee, what would happen if that, you know, and he goes through lots of uh, tortured mathematics to, to demonstrate his own position on this, is that yes, we probably are already in a virtual reality. And then what you see around us, you know, you, you've unplugged everything you can unplug, guess what, you're still in the matrix. You're still in the video game. So you, you're not, you haven't unplugged from anything. So now that it's just you, you know, like Thoreau, and you're face to face with reality, you're, you're still plugged into something, right? So, so that presents you with a whole different set of demands as to how to get through the thing. And also a different set of judgments that we can make about is, what is the thing? Um, are we really in a, could this be a virtual reality? Or is it really coming? My computer programming uh, friends, I've got two guys that work, actually software engineers, and they go, no, no, no. I mean, I expect computer geeks to love this idea. They, they're always the first ones to, to douse it. Um, but, the, but this guy says, no, because we, we engineers have this, this concept that we call the uncanny valley, right? You know what that means. Right? The, the uncanny valley is that absolute difference between the robot and the person. No matter, you can build the most perfect sex robot in the world, but you, that skin's too rubbery. That, they're, they're not it. You look at them in the eye, you talk to them, it tells you how wonderful you are, right? The, the perfect robot, the perfect game, the perfect Pixar video, you know it's not. Right? And that, according to the computer people, is that thing which will prevent us. The uncanny valley will, the uncanny valley will always be there, and will always serve as an impediment to creating the false reality. Now, if I think about that, I, that's no impediment whatsoever. This is the virtual reality, right? This, this, we are the uncanny thing, right? To, in, in the eyes of God, we're as weird as a sex spot. Right? I created this thing in my own image, but God, no, no, not in any image. That's not me. Right? That's not me. So, so we're trying, we're, we're desperately trying to, to gain communion with God when, you know, in the, to use, to paraphrase Lewis, God, God can't deal with us. God can't, you know, God loves me just the way I am. No, God can't really stand the way you are. You must change, right? So we're already possibly grappling with trying to negotiate the uncanny valley here. Uh, it's only natural that we would produce internets and videos and, and, and all kinds of weird gadgets because being co-creators with God, that's sort of what we do. So I don't, we can unplug, but we're never unplugged. And, and it's not going anywhere. And, and I'm sure these same conversations took place when they invented print. Oh, God. here we go. But we, we all know the, the story of Toth, and I think uh, Derrida talks about this in, the, in Plato's Pharmacon, where he's talking about the, this Toth. You know, Hermes goes up to the king of Egypt and says, I have the best thing in the world. I just invented writing. So we're, now we will never forget anything because we can write everything down. And the king goes, oh, no, no, no. We're going to forget everything. You're going to forget everything now because you've got this weird technology that's getting in the way of our ability to process information and use our memories. But writing hasn't gone anywhere. Um, the internet, and the internet's not going anywhere. And I don't know, I mean, I, I completely agree that we must unplug. But, but, and then I guess maybe again, here, here's, here's my point. You know, I, I spent 20 years trying to be an unplugged person, failed miserably at it. Through the grace of God, I wound up with, with uh, a wife, and then uh, we had two children, then I got divorced, and then I got married again, and now I have seven children total. None of this was entirely planned by me. This actually happened to me. I might as well have been in a game. I might as well have been completely, deep. this happened to me the same way you get taken from algorithm to algorithm, uh, you know, doing clickbait. I found myself, I, mean, I woke up one day and I had seven kids, a wife, a house, two cars, a truck. I had it all, absolutely confusing. And not once during that, fog of craziness that I ever doubt who I was, where I was going, or what my meaning in life was. That was the solution. That was the solution. I mean, the advice I give people now, though it sounds crazy, is to young people, have as many kids as you can possibly afford. Toss a couple in after that. Poverty will be your constant companion. Right? This is this is one of the spiritual counsels. Right? Poverty will be your companion. Um, your ego will die. None of these 
None of these guys ever pulled up. <laughs> Your ego will die. And you will not receive any visits from the noonday devil when you have little kids jumping on your lap and asking you to do things and destroying your paintbrushes, um, you know, all, all the hours that God sends. So while this is not what I want, uh, and it's never, I, I still see myself sitting on a mountain uh, contemplating the sound of one hand clapping. But that's not going to happen. I'm uh, 56 years old, my youngest child is three. So my chance of uh, having any of these, these, these fine, my desert is, is, is my backyard. My, my desert is, is when I wake up in the morning. Um, so I think, what I really think that what we need in life, and I think this is what the, why these, these men were really geniuses, is um, we need what Gurdjieff calls creative friction. Right? We need some friction. You need, this is not what I want. Good. Then, then deal with it. But if I go out in the desert and I have my cape, oh, this is everything I ever wanted, and I can, I can pray to God, God might not be listening. I, I, I don't, I'm not saying this is a tidy conclusion. I, I, to me, this is how it has seemed to work. But I, I will, so, so <clears throat> I don't know, I think the, the, the mess, the noise, and even the, the un, what seems to be a, de, a demonic barrage in the internet may be part of a, this, this plan for salvation. And if it's not, I do not think I'm capable of, of, of unplugging from it. And, and I'm a student of this. Um, for, for the average Joe, I suppose, who never really thinks about these things, it's, it's hopeless. So, so we're all lost. We, are, we, we may be in hell right now. It's not entirely impossible. I don't think it's likely. But you could make an argument. But there's a way out, right? Because this is the other, the other genius of the, of the Desert Fathers was with the Richard called it this textual icon. This is really brilliant. The, there, there must be contemplation. And contemplation isn't just emptying out as in the Buddhist tradition. The, the contemplation is, is an act of thinking. You using your brain, you think, you, you put things together. You listen to a lecture with a with this typed out, ready to go, and by the time you're done, you have this. Right? So th this is what this is what the, the Desert Fathers did, is they, they produced meaning from the use of their brain. They they and I have followed a meditative path for some years now that really involves something like the Zen koan, where you think of something absolutely illogical. You don't come with a tiny, you don't come to a tiny conclusion. What you get is insights. The insights are the product of pure thought. The, the insights come to you as you're thinking about things that are absolutely crazy. And sometimes it can be a basket of vegetables, like the, the Desert Father. Sometimes it can be a, the, the, the wonderful story about if you were a true monkey, you wouldn't even notice I was a, a woman. There's not a good Zen story like that. There's a monk, they, they, two monks are walking along and there's a woman at the, she's a prostitute, she's standing at the stream and one of the monks picks her up and walks her, takes her across the stream and sets her down and on they go. You know, half an hour later, the, the younger monk just, God, don't you know anything about our vocation and our vows? We're not supposed to, we're not even supposed to talk to women or look at them or, or you know, especially prostitutes, what on earth were you thinking? He goes, I don't know, I set that woman down half an hour ago, you're still carrying her. Right? So the, the, the idea that your, your thought, your thought is really the, your thought is the icon, our thought is really the, the technology, I think, that takes us from, from the place of, <coughs> of pure distraction, which, which reality always will be, to the point of, of salvation. So I guess maybe that would, I, I would agree, again, not, again not, not entirely sure about if we're even capable if we're even capable of unplugging to the degree, to the degree that the Desert Fathers uh, valorized. And, and I think when you look at their writings, they didn't either. They just didn't have cool technology on the front. But what they're, the, what they're, why they're wonderful is because they do give us an example of striving for the good, striving for the real, which is God, relentlessly, no matter what your circumstances are like. So, with that, I'll just wrap up my comments and thank you for a, a very fine talk and for all of you for coming out. We always have time at the Scratch Club for discussion. Maybe if we could get our speakers to uh, come have a seat up on the stage. We will. Turn to questions.
So, questions? Please. Hi, I'm Tristana. I haven't had the pleasure to have either of you guys in class, but I'm a senior here. Um, first, um, two, not a spirit issue, but qualms that I have. One for each of you guys, because um, I've tried to be, be fair. Um, the first, um, whether it was said more in dust or not, regarding um, the notion of procreating. Um, pro um, I am a diehard Catholic myself, but I think going off of the basis um, of like creating more of God's temptation or God's creation and then not having temptation because of that from like a religious lens, you also need to account for um, the resources that procreating uses in expending like God's creation um, and what happens with that regarding um, like Heidegger's notion of standing reserve and like how that shifts. So um, that was just something I wanted to link back to, even though it was a very brief little side note. Um, but I think it's important to recognize the other factors at play regarding how we engage with creation. Um, and then the second thing um, I was curious about regarding Professor Goodrich um, was, oh, regarding going out into the desert and isolation and the, um, the desert fathers, I'm always hesitant to put people on pedestals because um, I've found it to bite myself in the rear and um, just whether it's people that have passed away or people that are already here, but regarding putting them on a pedestal um, for removing themselves from society and going into isolation, I kind of view it as selfish um, just because of the communal aspect of Christianity. And again, I wasn't around in the 4th century BC, but so much of the faith to how I understand it is um, your call is to bring, like, get yourself to heaven, but also take as many of God's children with you as possible by like engaging and spreading the word. So um, it's kind of like that um, like critical thought needs to preface critical action, and going into the desert is kind of that critical thought notion, but there needs to be that re-engagement into society to prompt that critical action. Because um, I, I would be hesitant to say that it's focus if there's no distractions. That's just your reality. Um, so by eliminating, like putting yourself in a situation where you will be successful, like not encountering women or not wanting to stop for gelato, you are, um, it's good to set yourself up for success, but there also needs to be that coming down off the mountain and engaging with the rest of the people. Um, so those were just two little notions that I wanted to speak to. Another question? Yeah. You, can, you can say that. <laughs> well, because you said two things that I would respond to. One, one had to do with you're a diehard Catholic, but I should be cautious in my statements about talking about pro-life procreation, right? Did you say that? No, okay, no. Well, let, let me answer that. Yeah. If you're a diehard Catholic, surely you know that the church's teaching is that you procreate it and God's will will figure it out. Okay, That's the teaching. That, yes. That's what diehard Catholics believe. Now, we all know all the counter arguments. But there's another argument to this too. If it's a virtual reality, and this is a video game, it doesn't matter how much oil you burn or how many babies you have, because this is all digital information. So what these, what these events in life provide occasion for, are occasions to love, occasions to sacrifice, occasions to, to imagine a different kind of world. And I, think, I don't think a theologian would necessarily disagree with that. But if, if, if this is, if, again, this is a big if, if we're living in a video game, it doesn't matter how many children you have. And if you're producing them out of love and out of a desire to make the world a better place through the transmission of values, you better do it. So clarifying question, are you saying that in this world we are existing in a video game, so like the use of resources? That's the, that's the hypothesis. Okay. That, that, that the, the, the argument is, just as you can program, you can render into a game a building, a person, a hundred thousand. You can you can render into a world a hundred billion barrels of petroleum that nobody knew was sitting under the coastline of Ireland. Should you need that for the sake of the game? I'm being very serious. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. So, are you saying that we in itself are the virtual reality right now, or we could be in this and like just kind of throw up oil if we need it? Because in which case can introduce the question of like does there need to be love or experience or cherishing or even religion in a world if it's if you it's can't though, that the whole point is to act with love and with morality right so you cannot 
the preservation of resources is a moral decision, not really an economic or social one. If you, if you want to look at it from the standpoint of religion, we, we preserve, we, we, we conserve resources because it's wasteful, waste is sinful. Um, so, there's, so there's that question. But, but I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm taking Elon Musk and Nick Bostrom seriously, and they're serious people. And they, they would say that the that really what matters is the quality of our decision making, not the quality of our long term economic plan. Okay, make a first. So I think I think the rest of it was just meant for Oh yeah, it was yeah. just a little of both because you guys had a lot of good nuggets to pull from. Um, but I was just curious as far as well as I'm in a great philosophy of technology class with Bradley and Bessner right now and um, the philosophy department. So we're talking mm -hmm. about things as far as how we're engaging with um, technology. Um, and then I'm particularly researching technology regarding the Anthropocene and how we're looking at um, nature and technology and how it shifts. So like that's why I was curious about the engagement of resources because um, we, and I think you kind of speak to this too, but we don't live in a bubble, whether it's like you're out in the desert or in your immediate family, but we are. Um, citizens. Um, I could throw up one, one more thing that would be really good for you to chew on. My, my research is on a, I mean, the, the this age here, but there's a, a Japanese philosopher named Nishida Kitaro whose who's whole theory of, of, of creation is a dialectical unfolding between you know, a world, a world, a historical world of resources and things and the human being. The human is perpetually sacrificing itself to the world and the world is perpetually sacrificing itself to the human sphere. So Nishida argued back in the 30s that it may very well be the intention of the creator that this planet exhausts itself of its resources. You know, again, I, I wouldn't want to make a policy statement about this, but until <laughs> until that happens, then it doesn't come to its full point. If we're all going to pick this nice stasis where we a bunch of Amish people and choose enough technology that we can just be like this forever, that would might be cutting down on our potential. The okay. divine end human. And how do you spell the last name for uh, keep, uh, Nishida, N-I-S-H-I-D-A. And I can, I mean, I can, I'll talk to, to Dr. Bradley. I can point you in the direction. It's really, really interesting stuff. Okay, thank you. Dr. Goodrich, maybe could you address the question about whether escape turns out to um, to be the wrong move to make? To be selfishness. That was one of your questions, yeah. right? So selfishness is essentially what we're talking about. Um, I had a colleague when I, I used to teach in England at Bristol. And she and I had a continuous debate running on this particular topic because I, as you probably have gathered, really admired the Desert Fathers and I thought they were exemplars in a certain sense for Christian, Christian life and Christian virtue. And her point of view was, if they were real Christians, why in the world didn't they stay in the villages and help the poor and the, you know, take care of the orphans and the widows and, and the dispossessed people? And there's not a good answer for that because certainly it is a selfish action, I think, to move out into the desert. But the desert folks would probably say, if you were on a ship that was sinking, would you swim to the nearby island? In a certain sense, they felt that was the situation they were in. And they also felt, and this is something I didn't really talk about in this particular lecture, but they also felt a very profound sense of calling of God. And this is something that God wanted them to do. So, what is intriguing about the Desert Fathers is most of them cannot live on their own. They find being an absolute hermit, cut off from everybody else, is extraordinarily difficult. It's the elite among the Desert Fathers who do it. And so we get monasticism out of this, the Kenobitic movement, because people find it too difficult to live apart without social contact. And what fascinates me about the Desert Fathers is when you go and you read all the Gothic Mata, how much of it is actually dedicated to our social interaction, living with each other? And that is absolutely central to their experience, which you wouldn't think. You think, oh, they've gone off in the desert, they don't see anybody ever again. But that's not really true. They were, in a certain way, intensely social, you might think. And they do provide something for Christianity that, that endures in these things and teachings, which, as I would argue, serve as. Uh, I find it uh, just amazing in our conversation that being a hardcore Catholic is territory we're jockeying to defend. 
And so I just find that too deliciously uh, counterculture to not be able to take up. But, but, but uh, it's, it's too enjoyable. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take the bait. But I do think that there's something about being a Catholic that is suspicious of Gnosticism. And I think um, so. Cunningham and I have had a long-running friendship and conversation about this, but I always hear a little danger or temptation, and strangely in both of the, both of the presentations, um, to think of the world as something that salvation would require fleeing from nature and from the natural world. And so, I mean, it's a long conversation. I don't know too much what I can say that's a pointed uh, place, but maybe a place to start would be to say, I, uh, Eric, I, you spoke really eloquently about the frustrations of being in the world and having to find this as, as our desert. I find the same as a father. Mm -hmm. um, and as a teacher, that I don't have anything like the kind of time I would love to escape into uh, the garden uh, in order to meditate. Uh, but maybe there's a way to think about uh, this retreat as two things, as a retreat to the natural world, for one, mm -hmm. but also as a, I, I'm much more familiar with the Benedictine, the later tradition of work and prayer, which is, uh, has a much, very different resonance. But aren't the, the, the nuns and monks are praying for us? Because we don't have the space, we can't do it. So there, there's a sense in which I agree that we don't want to cut off the internet totally and so on, but that there's a, a refuge is the language that you were using, right? Um, and there, the life of the desert, um, none and monk, can be like refuge for all of us, I think. Well, so, Merton's yeah. argument. Merton always said that, that he believed if it weren't for the prayers of the monks that get seventy, the world would fall apart in a second. So would you say that too? That it's not self. There's a, there's a sense in which you can say that this is not selfish. Leaving the leaving the world in order to try. Which you're asking. Yes, I, 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 well, I think everything we do is selfish. Yeah. yeah. If you don't leave the world, you still act in a very selfish manner. If you do. So I think the sense of calling is extraordinarily important because I do think they felt that this was something that God had called for them. As a special, you know, the desert fathers do not ask everybody to move out into the desert, and there is you know, there is some dissonance in the text because you have text, for instance, where um, Abba Anthony is praying and suddenly you know, God comes to him, or a voice comes to him, and says, "Well, there's a guy living down in the village who's far more advanced than you are." So he was rushing down the village to find out what's going on, and this is a guy. He goes, "I don't, I don't know. I'm just a, you know, I'm a shepherd." Basically, I take a third of what I earn, and I give it as charity. I take a third, and I hold that for myself to live on, and a third I keep to welcome guests who are passing through the village. And it's great. Well, here I've been out in the desert all this time, and here is this guy who's living in the world and achieving these amazing things, too. What the Desert Fathers would say is that it's probably more likely, in a certain sense, you could cut off the distractions that you would make the spiritual progress that they hunger for. It's more difficult in the world. Um, well, I am a part of I'm not a philosophy student, nor am I a theologian, but I am a science major. And from what it sounds like to me, for the Desert Fathers, there wasn't really room for innovation or learning about the world around us. And I found it interesting because there was another lecture earlier this semester. Um, the speaker was Dr. Watson, who is a Jesuit priest and a chemist. And he talked about the integration model, which brings together the idea of learning about the world around us learning about um, all these molecules and how it comes together, <coughs> the creation of the universe, uh, is so close to learning about God. They're one and the same. So I was just wondering, what of the desert, like, what the <coughs> desert fathers say to something like that, that, that model? Well, I think you're living in a pre-scientific culture to begin with, so I don't think they're terribly interested in Think of the scientific questions. So that's not very satisfactory answer to that. But if, if you know what, I mean, if, if you look at contemplative life, and I'm, yeah, I'm not speaking of 
direct experience necessarily of this, but there's some of the, especially in the Buddhist tradition, there are, there are discussions of worlds upon worlds and machines and they're, they're, they're given by uh, monks, particularly in the, uh, the Lotus tradition. And they're describing architectonic wonders. They're, they're describing the inner workings of, of, of the cell, of the body, of the planet itself. And they, they arrived at this through contemplation. This was a particularly useful knowledge to them. They, they, they used it to behold the wonder of, of, of the universe. But they didn't think, well, I, I better go build a helicopter. You know what I mean? So like, like Dr. Gerber said, they weren't, they, it was a different set of concerns, I think. But for all we know, they may have figured out how to split the atom and, and chuckle at it. You know, do you know what I mean? They, it just wasn't, and they, well, I hope no one's dumb enough to ever do that. Right? So they, you know, the wisdom may have, may have surpassed those of us in our, you know, <coughs> sort of self-celebratory scientific world. I mean, you know, I'm just, it's just something to, to, to toss out. But, but you, there is evidence of this kind of, uh, of this kind of awareness that we would probably call more mechanical or more architectural. I don't know. Um, I have a comment and a question. With regard to the selfishness aspect, if we look at the long-term tra trajectory of monasticism, especially in the Benedictine tradition, uh, it became very service-oriented um, and uh, as, um, also places where lay people could go and find peace and refuge on pilgrimages and so forth. Uh, that was my comment. But my, my question about unplugging, one of the things I've noticed um, after I started using the internet a lot was that even after I unplugged, I still retained the same cadences of mind and uh, mental habits that I had <laughs> that was forged in, in the, with the digital technology and starting to uh, look to books to give me the same things that I got off the, uh, the internet. And then I was, I was fascinated to see studies that show that our, our frontal cortex is actually rewired. So the problem, it, it, it's not as simple as just unplugging because even when we unplug, we're, we, the, the impulse control, the need for distractions, something we, we retain. So how can we, how can we take the next step to re, sort of reverse engineer the rewiring of the neural circuitry that happens? Um, with with the internet and our various devices. I'm not a physiologist, so I can't answer your question. But my experience is, I've been an avid reader all my life. I love to read books. I've spent hours and hours as a kid reading books. I'd rather read books and watch television. And I found over the last five years, eight years, that my ability to sit and read a book was called especially if it was a moment if I was reading Dostoevsky or something like that. I just, goodness, I can't do it. And I realize it's because click, click, click. If I get bored on the internet, click. I'm away to something else and click. As soon as that stops interesting me, I'm clicking to something else. To have that ability to concentrate for a protracted period of time has been severely compromised. And I think that is what you're talking about right there. I don't know if I'm not a physiologist. Is it a matter of if you were to stop and start concentrating on things, you could rewire that. I don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. But certainly I've been trying to not use electronic devices on Sundays. It's just a first step. And it's hard. I wake up in the morning and think, oh, I just, I just have to check on the phone. And well, I just have, it's, it's always there. They did try to read, uh, memorize scripture partially because they didn't have a lot of books. Books are extraordinarily expensive at that time. And so they had far greater abilities of memorizing things than we have. Um, and that is also, there's, I should say, there's some doubt about books because books are so expensive. There are a couple very charming stories 
about where uh, the desert father, a young novice, essentially goes to a more advanced man and says, well, I've got this lovely Bible that just came into my possession. What should I do with it? And the father says, well, you should sell it and give the money to the poor, of course. What else would you do with it? So even possessing something that was object of such great wealth, books are extraordinarily expensive during this time. So, so memorization to it is the key to success out there. Um, this is a very, like, maybe answer to your question, but I'm an undergrad. So about the rewiring? Oh, sorry. I'm a, so this is maybe an answer to your question about physiology, but I take this with a grain of salt because I'm only in my fourth year of studying anything physiology. Um, but it's been shown that in terms of neural, especially with addictions, they, you, over time, the more that you use a certain pathway of your brain, the stronger the neural connections get and then you get increased um, like response, you get the sensitization, and then, but it's also interesting because based upon the, and if you stop doing that, then over time you can actually change the physiology of your brain once more to go back to normal. But it's also super interesting because what they're seeing, and this is at least with physical addictions such as dopamine, opioids, things like that, so I'm not sure about um, computer addictions, that there's epigenetic changes, so the DNA of you is, get, is getting methylated within your expression of your DNA, and that can go down all the way to your grandchildren. So the effects of addiction are going to be, I mean, science will show that it's going to be long-term effects um, that are going to be happening. It's not just going to be one person. Our, the, our children, they're already seeing increasing um, reports of ADHD. They've already seen lower attention span, and that problem is only going to get worse as a society as society goes forward, so. But yes, short term, you can actually change it. You're just gonna go through the same withdrawal or specific symptoms as other addictions. You want to go on the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just I acknowledge that I'm in it. <laughs> but you can just, just subscribe to NeuroLock and you'll be fine. <laughs> 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 you are, you're so people have talked about it being being selfish to go to the desert. Do you think it's actually easier? Do you think they had it? <coughs> well. I heard, I heard a few people said that as well. It was easier to be out there. Away, but is that true, do you think? No. And I think renunciation to choose that sort of life is a very difficult thing to begin with. Get rid of everything I have and move out into the desert. I'm going to trust God to take care of me in some way, and I'm going to trust that I won't go mad. That I suppose is the bigger issue. But that's the desert. I mean, I'm an oblate at Mount Angel, having you know, about this a bit. <laughs> um, the happiest people I've ever met are the monks in that particular monastery. They're not in the desert, they're like the, the Kenites. They, they, they were there. They figured out the idea of life to some levels. They give up a lot. But I don't know, that's a, I mean, I think it's hard. It's one of those things where you make a decision now with an expectation that if you're just faithful for 20 years of long success, you probably at the time even getting married, going in the army, so it all looks pretty horrible. <laughs> but but when, you do, when you do it, if you realize, oh, this, this, I got, I reaped more benefits from this than I ever imagined. I hope that was the position the six in the we're a little over time now. Uh, of course, the conversation continues. Stick around if you'd like. I want to say again that the sign-up list for the Socratic Club is over on the snack table as our snack, so grab something. Let's thank our speakers again.